بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعده um, All praises due to Allah uh, Peace and blessings be upon our Prophet Muhammad عليه وآله وسلم First, have to point out that uh, أنا على هذا المجلس أنا متطفل this, um, this position is not really for me Since Sheikh, uh, our Sheikh Uthman Al-Khamis Hafizah Allah that's his uh, position and that's his platform. And uh, I do feel humbled that I'm allowed to speak here, but I will take the opportunity to share something, some of what I know. Uh, the topic of this talk is simply about the names and attributes of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta-A'la. How to worship Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta-A'la through his names and attributes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the main theme in, or the main verse in this whole context is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا And to Allah belong the most beautiful name, فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا Now the literal translation of this means call upon him by means of his names. Call upon him by means of his names. But like Shaykh al-Islam and Taymiyyah pointed this out, and then it was pointed out mainly again by Sheikh Ibn Uthameen, Ta'ala, he further explained it. And he said, فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا الدُّعَاءُ here to call upon Allah by means of his names. وَدُعَاءُ الطَّلَبُ وَدُعَاءُ الْعِبَادَةِ There are two types. دُعَاءُ الطَّلَبُ in the sense you're asking, you're calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're asking something of him. اللَّهُمَّ اغْفِرْ لِي اللَّهُمَّ ارْحَمْنِي اللَّهُمَّ ارْزُقْنِي So you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for some of his blessings. Whether they are worldly blessings or they are blessings with regards to your heart and your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is also dua ul ibadah, which is basically that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names. You worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names. And there's a beautiful meaning here because Allah calls all of this dua. And this shows as Imam al Qayyim clarifies in Tariq al Hijratain, he actually clarifies that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a form of asking of him you're beseeching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you worship him when you make dhikr you're beseeching Allah when you make your salah you're beseeching Allah it's an a practical or physical way of asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically you're asking Allah for nearness to him you're asking Allah for more love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're asking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in, in what you do in terms of acts of worship uh, and also many of the scholars actually they said كُلُّ عِبَادَةٍ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ كُلُّ عِبَادَةٍ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ إِنَّمَا هِيَ فِي حَقِيقَتِهَا عَمَلٌ بِمُقْتَضَى أَسْمَاءِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ وَصِفَاتِهِ Every worship in Islam, every, all the aspects of worship in Islam that we have whether they are deeds of the body physical deeds أعمال الجوارح or أعمال القلوب which are the deeds of our hearts the inner actions that we do they said all of them are manifestations of our belief in the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are actually, they branch out all of them from our belief in the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes. فَكُلُّ عِبَادَةٍ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ إِنَّمَا هِيَ عَمَلٌ بِمُخْتَضَى أَسْمَاءِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ وَصِفَاتِهِ We'll come to visit this point, inshallah, with further detail. Uh, also, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith, he actually points to the fact of the importance of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names and attributes and he says in the authentic hadith إِنَّ لِلَّهِ تِسْعَةً وَتِسْعِينَ اسْمًا مِئَةً إِلَّا وَاحِدًا مَنْ أَحْصَاهَا دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Indeed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there are 99 names Indeed for Allah there are 99 names 100 except 1 or 100 minus 1 Whoever أَحْصَاهَا is the word إِحْصَاء then he will enter paradise and إِحْصَاء as the scholars said uh, literally, ihsa would actually mean enumerate, would be translated as enumerating them or memorizing them. But this is not the whole meaning. This is only a small segment of the meaning. The meaning, as the scholars said, ihsa'uha huwa ma'rifatu ma'naha wal imanu bi muqtadaha wal amalu biha. So they said al ihsa that you basically learn the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you really learn them, figure them out, understand their meanings, and you believe in these meanings. And then you actually act based on the meanings of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So literally, 
that's in line with what the verse that we quoted actually says, which is basically that you worship, which is dua al ibadah, which is you worship Allah through the meanings of His names and His attributes. So, and the Prophet says in this hadith, whoever does this, then they will be granted paradise. Dakhal al Jannah. This is a guarantee to enter paradise if a person worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He learns the names of Allah and their meanings and he believes in them or she believes in them and they act upon this. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala says in Madaraj al-Salikin, he says, طَرِيقُ أَوْ تَعَبُّدِ لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ بِأَسْمَائِهِ وَصِفَاتِهِ طَرِيقٌ سَهْلٌ وَاضِحٌ قَرِيبٌ He says, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names and attributes is a very easy way and is very close, very short way that leads to paradise. لا قطاع فيه There are no bandits, there's no highway on that path, the path of worshipping Allah through the names and the attributes. ولا عوارض تعتريه And there are no distractions around it. There's no obstacles on that way. يصل السالك فيه على جنب من الراحة إلى أعلى درجات الجنة he says the, the person who follows this way, they reach the highest ranks in paradise even though they're not exerting themselves that much. Even though that they are taking it easy. They're reaching the highest levels in paradise. And this is why he says in another uh, place, in another of his books, he says, He says that the worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the, his names and attributes is actually the way of the muqarrabin, the ones that are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you guys attended uh, Shaykh Ali al-Harran's uh, uh, and sh- even Shaykh uh, Uthman al-Khamis's lecture yesterday, he spoke about al-muqarrabin, the closest, the ones that are closest to Allah because he divided the believers or the people in paradise into two levels. There's Ashab al-Yameen, the people of the ha- right hand, and those are the biggest, you know, mass or portion of the people who will enter paradise. But there is the highest rank, highest, the highest in rank, and these are al-muqarrabun. These are the ones who are closest to Allah subhanahu wa taala, and these are the ones who will get the first paradise, two two gardens that were mentioned in Surah Al-Rahman. So today's lecture is actually about just giving some suggestions and shedding some light on how we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names and attributes. Hopefully we take that path that Imam Al-Qayyim talked about, that it is so close and so straightforward leads to the highest ranks in paradise. Uh, first we have to point out that the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to some classification, fall into two types. Some of them are what we can call sifatul azamah. These are the names and attributes that uh, indicate the greatness and the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are like Al-Azim, Allah Al-Azim. And uh, some of, like these, me- and like al- uh, the attributes of Allah Al-Kibriya and Al-Izz, the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These names can only apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if humans try to take a share of them, this would be a grave sin. As occurs in the hadith of the Prophet uh, or the uh, authentic hadith uh, or the Qudusi hadith, the hadith al-Qudusi where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrates from Allah wa ta'ala that he says, Al-kibriya'u ridai wal-izzu izari That pride is my garment and glory is my cloak. فَمَنْ نَازَعَنِي فِي أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمَا شَيْئًا قَصَمْتُهُ So whoever tries to get a share of them, he competes with me over a share of pride, my pride and my glory, then I will break his back. I will break his back. So basically, these are attributes, the attributes of Al-Azama, Sifatul Al-Azama, they pertain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and since Allah is Al-Ghani, Ya nas, antumul ila Allah. And we are fuqara, we are poor, we, we are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who possesses everything. So recognizing that glory and that greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recognizing our weakness and our deficiency, that should be the standard. We cannot compete with Allah over His glory. So these names and attributes should be only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The attributes of glory. The attributes of glory and we can only get them in this world by means of extension 
of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And glory and victory will actually belongs or will be given to Allah, to His Messenger and the believers. But you can't claim it for yourself as an attribute. You can't seek for it. You can't ask for it. Ask people to glorify you and hold you uh, in high pedestals. You can't actually ask for that. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ says in the authentic hadith, showing that anyone who competes with Allah over some of his names, which are Asma'ul Azama and Sifatul Azama, these names and attributes that pertain to the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Messenger ﷺ says, يُحْشَرُ الْمُتَكَبِّرُونَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ كَأَمْثَالِ الذَّرِّ يَطَعُهُمُ النَّاسُ بِأَقْدَامِهِمْ On the day of judgment, those people who had pride and haughtiness, and this arrogance about themselves, they will be resurrected on the day of judgment in the shape of ants, where they will be stepped on by people who are walking on the day of judgment. Why? Because they sought something that belongs to Allah and it doesn't belong to them. They sought it and they put themselves on high pedestals. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to treat them in kind and take away what they were seeking. So the, the punishment will be in kind. So الْجَزَاءُ مِنْ جِنْسِ amal. But there are names and attributes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are actually supposed to emulate. We are supposed to found and establish within ourselves. And we can see this in some hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And these are usually صِفَاتُ rahma, صِفَاتُ rahma. And these are usually the attributes and the names that signify mercy. That signify mercy. For example, the Prophet says in the authentic hadith, الرَّاحِمُونَ يَرْحَمُهُمُ الرَّحْمَانِ إِرْحَمُوا مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يَرْحَمُكُمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ The ones that are merciful, Allah will be merciful to them, or the most merciful will be merciful to them, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be merciful to those who live on earth, the, ones who, the one who is above the heavens will be merciful or will show mercy to you. So these names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are supposed to learn from them. And the way we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through them is actually to try to possess some of those traits and display them and exercise them within ourselves. Unlike the attributes of Al-Azamah, the attributes of glory, because those are exclusively for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the names and attributes that signify mercy and kindness through doing the same. As the Prophet says, if you are merciful to creation, then this is a reason for Allah to show mercy and shower mercy upon you. Another hadith, the Prophet says, Inna Allah rafiqun yuhibbur rifq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kind and gentle and he loves kindness and gentleness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives and rewards for kindness and gentleness more than what he gives for harshness and strictness. So that shows that this attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a rifq, kindness, gentleness, and also a hint of patience, is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and appreciates about himself, and he would love to see the same from his creation. So this is why... Uh, the Prophet ﷺ says, مَا كَانَ الرِّفْقُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَانَهُ وَمَا نُزِعَ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا شَانَهُ That kindness, whenever kindness and gentleness and easygoingness is found in something, it would beautify it. But whenever, whenever it's taken away from something, then that thing would lose its beauty. So we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with such a name, an attribute like al-rafiq, the, the kind, the gentle, the easygoing, is by trying to emulate that within ourselves. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, for example, an extension of this meaning, the Prophet ﷺ praises some, uh, like a person in their dealings who display this kind of, of character or attribute. The Prophet ﷺ says, رَحِمَ اللَّهُ مْرِئًا سَمْحًا إِذَا بَعْ سَمْحًا إِذَا اشْتَرَى سَمْحًا إِذَا اقْتَضَى uh, May Allah have mercy upon someone who shows this kindness and gentle and, and beauty and kindness to and easygoingness to when they sell, when they buy, or even when they ask for their for their rights back. Like you 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 give someone money, you lend someone money, and you loan them money, but then you take it back. Even when you take it back, you take it with gentleness and with kindness and mercy. 
So this is something will bring about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. So we need to differentiate between these two types of names and attributes of Allah. The names of glory, the names of the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these are exclusively for Allah. And how do we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these names? And that's a question for you, by the way. How can we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What's the way to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names of glory, like al azim Al-Jabbar, Al-Mutakabbir. All these are the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we worship Allah through these meanings? Any idea? Forming the ibadat. Show me the connection. Through dhikr. Okay. Huh? When you make dua, when you make dua, yes, so this is dua al ibadah. When you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, yeah, you want Allah, for example, to punish oppressors, you use the word al jabbar al mutakabbir. Fine, that's a good example. What else can we do? Avoid his punishment, knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is severe in punishment and he's al muntaqim. So you basically, this brings about terror in your heart and fear of the punishment of Allah. So that basically helps you to abstain from sin. What else? What else can we do? You know, because these names we said are exclusively for Allah, what you can do is possess the opposite for yourself. And the opposite of this glory and might of Allah is that you actually humble yourself. So you have humility with regards to Allah's kibriya and glory and izzah. So you recognize that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you recognize you have the opposite. The same thing with Al-Ghani. One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he is Al-Ghani. He's the, he's the one who's self-sufficient. He's the one who possesses everything. And he's the one who's truly rich. And we are poor. We are in need. We stand in need of Allah. So that the fact that you realize that you possess the opposite and you establish this within yourself, which is, a, for example, with the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have a tawadu'. You have a tawadu'. مَنْ تَوَاضَعَ لِلَّهِ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ Whoever humbles himself for Allah, then Allah would elevate their status. So worship Allah through the names of glory by what? By acknowledging their meaning and acknowledging that we have the opposite and that we need that. We need to connect for Allah, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we have the opposite. We, because we are poor and we are in need, we connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He's Al Ghani. We humble ourselves and we put ourselves down. That's why in salah you put your head on the ground. Why? Because you recognize the highness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like in sujood, what do you say? Subhana Rabbiya Al A'la. When do you say, Subha Glory be to Allah the Most High? When do you say this? When you put your head down. You see, you take the position, the lowest position, and you recognize the highness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the difference. So we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by possessing the opposite of the names of glory, asma al azama wal kibriya. Whereas with the names of mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we try to possess the same. We try to emulate them. We try to emulate these names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why, like one of the hadith uh, where the Prophet describes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Inna Allah jameelun yuhibbul jamal. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful and he loves beauty. Beauty. This is why Imam al Qayyim in Madarj al Salikin, he actually talks about al Jamal. He talks about worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his name or through his attribute al Jamal. That Allah jameelun. Allah is jameel. Allah is beautiful. And Allah loves beauty. And Allah appreciates beauty. And this is why he actually goes on to elaborate on this. And he says, if you look at Islam, it's all beauty. So he describes Salah and he says, look at Salah. It's the most beautiful act of worship. It's so comprehensive that you stand up. You start Salah standing up in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you express your devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in words by reciting his own words. And then you go down for ruku'ah. And you sort of humble yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you stand up again. Then, so he says, فَالصَّلَاةُ شُرِعَتْ عَلَىٰ أَحْسَنِ وَجْهٍ وَأَجْمَلِ هَيْئَةٍ So he says, Salah has been designed in the best shape and the best uh, and the most beautiful of displays. So he says, وَالشَّرِعَةُ مُقْتَضَاهَا عَلَىٰ الْجَمَالِ 
He says, all of Islam, if you look at the legislation of Islam, you will find that beauty runs through all the legislation of Islam. All of the legislation of Islam. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ, for example, we have in Islam, we have Sunan al-Fitrah. You know, Sunan al-Fitrah, the things that we are supposed to do, like uh, trimming the mustache short, uh, clipping our nails, removing the armpit hair, uh, you know, clearing the private area as well, shaving it, and so on and so forth. All of these are what? These are practices of beauty, beautification, beautification. And Aisha radiyallahu anha, growing the beard, for example, so Aisha radiyallahu anha, she used to say, She used to swear by Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, says, by Allah who beautified men with beards. So this concept was there, was there among the companions of the Prophet sallallahu So we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through beauty, through beauty. And the Prophet ﷺ, in a number of hadith, he actually, like some of the companions came to the Messenger ﷺ, and they asked him about kibriya, they asked him about pride and arrogance. And uh, basically one of the companions asked, he said, Ya Rasulullah, ar-rajulu yuhibbu an yakuna hasanan fi malbasihi wa fi hayatihi. That a man really loves, like a person loves to be presentable and beautiful in how they dress up and, you know, their whole like image. The Prophet ﷺ, this is when he says the statement, إِنَّ اللَّهَ جَمِيلٌ يُحِبُّ الْجَمَالِ Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. And He loves beauty. So beauty is part and parcel of Islam. And as I said, Ibn al-Qayyim, Ibn al-Qayyim says, it runs through all of the legislations of Islam. He says, كُلُّ أَحْكَامِ الشَّرِيعَةِ مَبْنَاهَا عَلَى الْجَمَالِ And in Islam, Alhamdulillah, Jamal is not only in the external image. Not only in the external image. We have the inner beauty. And if you look at the, uh, you know, whatever Islam, whatever we are supposed to believe in, in terms of aqidah, actually adds inner beauty to us. Look at all what Islam calls us. The Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّمَا I was sent to perfect good character, good manners. What is good character and good manners? It's inner beauty. You know, nothing captivates. Oftentimes people worry about cosmetics so much, right? People worry about their image, they worry about their shirts and their pants and their, you know, whatever they dress up with and so on and so forth. And they wear perfume. They worry about these cosmetics. But we don't realize nothing captivates humans. Honestly, nothing captivates humans like good morals. Really. Nothing captivates humans like a good character, like honesty, like courage, like uh, truthfulness, like helpfulness. These things inspire and they captivate. And these are part of beauty. So you will find this, as, as Imam Al-Qayyim said, runs through Islam. Everything in Islam is based on this type of beauty, whether external or internal or both of them. So, in Allah jameelun yuhibbul jamal. So the Prophet ﷺ clarified to this companion when he asked about being presentable, that this is actually a good aspect. It's not only it's, uh, it's okay, but it's actually part and parcel of Islam because this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And Shaykh al-Islam al Taymiyyah, when he defined worship, al-ibadah, he said, هِيَ كُلُّ مَا يُحِبُّهُ اللَّهُ وَيَرْضَاهُ مِنَ الْأَعْمَالِ الظَّاهِرَةِ وَالْبَاطِنَةِ When he defined worship, he says, it is everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. From among the deeds that are either external deeds, physical deeds that we do with our limbs, or inner deeds that we do with our hearts, a'malul qulub, inner actions. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves something, then automatically this thing is an act of worship. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves beauty, that means beauty in Islam is part of worship. So, you know, when, when your house is beautiful, in the sense it's clean, it's presentable, it doesn't have to be extravagant, by the way. It doesn't have to be extra extravagant. When it's tidy and nice, when you are presentable in the way you dress up, when you are presentable and beautiful in the way you carry yourself, the way you speak, the way you behave, the way you argue, all of this is actually an act of worship. And worship, and this is actually an act of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names and, and his attributes. So I want to move on now to uh, just a different level of conceptualization when it comes to this. As I said, some of the scholars said, الدين كله أو شرائع الإسلام كلها 
هي تعبد لله عز وجل بمقتضى أسمائه وصفاته All of Islam, all of Sharia If you really study it, you will come to the conclusion You arrive at the conclusion that it's all really uh, worshipping it's, it's, uh, it's all based on worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Through his names and attributes And I want to give one, one comprehensive example And that's basically Salah Salah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَأَقِمَ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي And establish the salah, the, the prayer For my remembrance So what does that mean? That means salah is a time for you to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala It's not that you forget Allah And remember him And remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala You're not remembering someone who's absent You're not remembering someone who's absent The Prophet sallallahu wa sallam said to the companions إِنَّكُمْ لَا تَدْعُونَ أَصَمَّ وَلَا غَائِبَا you're not calling when the companions were making dua in the masjid and they started crowding each other with their noise. The, that was the Prophet was making the atikaf. He said, Arbi'u ala anfusikum. He said, Take it easy. فإنكم لا تدعون أصم ولا غا ولا غائبة. He says, You guys take it easy. Don't start raising your voice over one another because you're not calling upon someone who's deaf. Who, Allah is neither deaf nor is he absent. But you are calling upon someone who is very close to you and he's responsive to you. So when you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not that you, Allah is absent and now you are just remembering him. No, Allah is with you. We're closer to him than his jugular vein. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, clo is closer to us. And that's the meaning, one of the meanings of al Zahir al Batin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most high and he's the closest as well. He's the closest to you. So remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means that you engage in direct communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In salah, you are engaging in direct communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, this is why the Prophet sallallahu quotes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hadith al-Qudusi, قسمت الصلاة بيني وبين عبدي نصفين. I have divided or I have split the salah between me and my servant. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. فإذا قال عبدي الحمد لله رب العالمين فإذا قال العبد Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Qala Allah Hamadani Abdi So if you say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Allah would say My servant has praised me The moment Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim says In his, in his section Ahkam al-Sama' He says When you pray your salah You might want to take a pause Just to let yourself settle in the belief That Allah responds to you When you say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Allah says My servant praised me الرحمن الرحيم إذا قال العبد الرحمن الرحيم قال الله مجدني عبدي أو أثنى مجدني عبدي أو سوري أثنى علي عبدي that my servant has praised me a second time one more time فإذا قال العبد مالك يوم الدين قال الله مجدني عبدي so when you say مالك يوم الدين Allah سبحانه وتعالى would say my servant has glorified me and recognized my might فإذا قال العبد إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين قال الله هذا بيني وبين عبدي ولعبدي ما سأل When you say إياك نعبد It's you that we worship and we seek And it's your help that we ask for So Allah would say This is between me and my servant And for my servant Or my servant is going to get what he asks for Basically for Allah is the worship That's Allah's share And your share is the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala To help you worship him so in your salah, you're actually worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his name, Allah. Because what's the meaning of the name Allah? What does, because Ar-Rahman means the most merciful. Uh, Al-Aziz means the Almighty. Uh, Al-Basir, the All-Seer. Al-Sami' the All-Hearer. What is the meaning of Allah? So some scholars have differed, but Allah Mushtaq, it's, it's, a, it's a derived name. Basically, it has a root and it has a meaning. So it's not just a name. Yeah, what's the meaning of Allah? Ilah. So he's the one that is worshipped. Al-Ma'luhu. Allah, Al-Ma'luh. Al-Ma'luhu bihaq. He's the one that is worshipped in truth. So what does Ilah mean? Ilah itself? It comes the one who's truly worshipped, who truly deserves to be worshipped, which also comes, as Sheikh Islam Taymiyyah explained in so much detail, that uh, The essence of worship is love, loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And then after that, obviously, love has other requirements that join it, like fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why since worship, or since salah is the primary act of worship in Islam, physical act of worship, and actually a more, it's a more comprehensive than just physical, then you are actually, when you perform your salah, you are worshiping Allah through his name, Allah. You are showing your devotion and your worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only in your heart, but in your heart and on your tongue and with your physical body. You're making, the salah is a statement of the fact that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you recognize he's the only one who has the right to be worshipped. But look at salah, it's more comprehensive than this. After you recite the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you actually go for ruku'ah. Let's just look at ruku'ah. What do you say in ruku'ah? Subhana rabbiya al-azim. Al-azim. So in ruku'ah, you're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his name, al-azim. The great, the most great. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ says, أَمَّا الرُّكُوعَ فَعَظِّمُوا فِيهِ الرَّبِّ In ruku' as for ruku', you glorify the Lord. You glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the ruku'. So ruku' is mainly, is mainly about glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why some of the scholars said it is impermissible to make dua in ruku'. Ruku' is not for dua. He said, because the Prophet says, This is a matter of dispute. But it shows that many of the scholars recognize that the point in ruku' is glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point is glorifying Allah. So you should dedicate your ruku' to glorifying Allah. So when you are in that position, you are supposed to feel it. You are suppo- and actually the body posture that you put your head down, you bow down, actually helps you feel your weakness and your nothingness compared to the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Physically, it aids you. It puts you in that position to help you figure it out in your mind and in your heart. And then you state it with your tongue, Subhana Rabbi al azim So in ruku' you're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his name, al azim And then, in sujood, again, we said you put your body, specifically your head, in the lowest point, recognizing the highness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you put yourself down subhana rabbi al-a'la and the subhanallah the beauty of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when do you get the closest to Allah in sujood when you recognize that you deserve to be in the lowest level Allah deserves to be in the highest place and you recognize you know the disparity that's when you are closest to Allah this is why the Prophet ﷺ says, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجِدٌ فَأَكْثِرُ فِيهِ مِنَ الدُّعَاءِ The closest a person is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they are in sujood. You put yourself down and you recognize the highness of Allah, Allah is closest to you then. Allah is closest to you then. So you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your sujood mainly through his name, Al-A'la. Al-A'la, the most high. This is the main or the primary Name through which you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in sujood. But we have additions as well. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al qareeb Allah is the close. He's qareeb One of his attributes that he's qareeb And that he's what? al batin al batin is the closest to you. The closest to you. So we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our sujood by feeling the nearness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Feeling the nearness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that position. And what else do we, uh, another name that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through in sujood is Al-Mujib, the one who responds, the one who answers the dua, answers the call. So actually in your salah, you are already worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names and attributes. But being aware of this, being aware of this, it adds a lot of intensity, adds a lot of meaning as you are doing it, instead of you doing it absent-mindedly. So when you contemplate these meanings, you will see that salah is rich. Is rich and full of meanings. It's full of worship, the meaning of worship. So you actually, and this is why Imam Al Qayyim, when he talks about salah, he says, He says, Salah, he says, like a big feast that has every color and every type of food and blessings. It is so diverse, it has a lot of aspects in the salah in terms of worship, and it has a lot of meanings for the heart to ponder on and benefit from. So salah itself is actually 
uh, every part of salah, every small part, everything you say in salah is actually an act of worship, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through one, at least one of his names and attributes, or more, most of the time. So what if we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names and attributes, not only in the prescribed acts of worship like salah, and fast and so on and so forth. What if we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout our life in every sort of every moment in our life, in every situation we find ourselves in, in every condition that we, we are in. We worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through that. You know when the scholars talk about tawakkul, they talk about tawakkul and they said, like Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he says, tawakkulu ma'rifatullah. He says, tawakkul, the reality of tawakkul is knowing Allah. Like tawakkul itself is not knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's a fruit of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why Shaykh al-Islam in Taymiyyah, he says, مَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَكُونَ أَشْجَعَ النَّاسِ فَلْيُكْثِرْ مِنْ قَوْلِهِ لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ He says, whoever wants to be the bravest of people, let him increase in saying, لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ There is no might, there is no power except with Allah. He says, if you feed your heart that meaning, you will find a lot of bravery because you know everything, all matters are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So tawakkul is actually tawakkul, which is a state. Tawakkul is not an, an external action, it's a state, one of the actions of the heart. You want to call it emotion, call it emotion, but it's a state of mind, a state of heart that you actually put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards for this, and Sheikh Uthman al Khamis yesterday, if you guys, any of you was, Paying attention, Shaykh Uthman al-Khamis, he says, Allah rewards the most for actions of the heart. Allah rewards, the highest rewards that Allah gives are for the actions of the heart. For the actions of the heart. So tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually gives you a lot of reward. A lot, why? Because it takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of belief. It takes a lot of trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah, for example, says, uh, إِنَّا لَنَنْصُرُ رُسُولَنَا وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا He says, indeed, we give victory to our believers, or to the, our messengers and the believers. The more you trust in this, the more you're going to get with it. Often, oftentimes, unfortunately, the case with us, that we don't truly, be, we just say it. But we don't truly believe in it. It doesn't show as a state of mind in our lives. It doesn't show as a state of mind. It doesn't show as a trust. This is why it was the dua of some of al salihin, some of the righteous people in the early history of Islam. Allahumma inni as'aluka husna al-dhanni bik wa sidqa tawakkuli alayk. Oh Allah, I ask you to help me have good thoughts about you. Have good uh, you know, impressions about you and to be truthful in my reliance on you. It's not just to say, I put my trust in Allah. I mean, it's not, it's not just cl about claims. It has to be a state, even if you don't say anything about it. Well, oftentimes, and it happens often, that I, uh, I hear people, sometimes uh, we ourselves are guilty actually of this. Some will come and complain about a situation, it's hard and I can't deal with it, and I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like depressed, sometimes I'm having suicidal thoughts, and I wonder when is this going to end, why did this happen to me? Then after they make this whole litany of complaint, they start saying, you know what? But Alhamdulillah, I'm happy with what Allah has given me. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. You're just contradicting what you just said, right? So why? Because we don't want our faith to be just claims. قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُ وَلَكِنْ قُلُوا أَسْلَمْنَا وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ You know, some of the Bedouins and the nomads came to the Prophet ﷺ and they were bragging about themselves. They said, we have believed. Because they embraced Islam and they said, we have become believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed down this verse and he instructed the Prophet to say to them, don't claim faith. Don't claim faith for you. And Iman has not yet entered your hearts properly. Do not claim that for yourself. Because it's a process. It's a process. You need to work your way through to achieve tawakkul, to achieve belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our lives through his names and attributes. And believe me, every problem we have in life, every issue, every predicament, there are names, some of the names and attributes of Allah are the keys out of it, are the solution to it. And if you don't recognize them and figure them out, or if you have wrong thoughts about them, you will suffer more. 
you will just suffer more. So for example, people who are going through hardship, if they, now their faith in Allah that he's Ar-Razzaq, their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's Ar-Razzaq, he's the provider. If they truly have true faith and belief about it, even though they see scarcity around them and lack, and they don't have the finances, but their belief is not shaken by these circumstances. And that's the challenge, and that's the test of faith. If they hold on to that belief and they know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the provider and they know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kareem and they know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lahu malakutu kulli shay every Allah possesses everything Allah is in control of everything if they hold on to this belief then this will save them through that predicament but the problem with people is that they start questioning their faith if Allah is a razzaq why doesn't he give me if Allah is the provider, what doesn't He offer me? If Allah is kind and generous, why doesn't He why doesn't He relieve me out of this predicament? The problem in, is when our faith in our immediate circumstances challenges our faith and what we know about Allah. That's what we shouldn't do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the believers, and this is actually the difference between believers and hypocrites. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the believers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet promised them victory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger وسلم, promised them victory on Ghazwat al Ahzab. Ghazwat al Ahzab, the Prophet وسلم, specifically, when the Ahzab, 10,000 soldiers, attacked Medina from the north and they set a siege around it. And Banu Quraida, who the Muslims entrusted to cover their back, they have gone, they have gone against the treaty. They've gone back against the Muslims on the treaty and they violated you know, that agreement of common defense. And the Muslims were vulnerable, they were exposed from behind. When the news came to the Prophet وسلم, that Banu Qurayza have betrayed the trust and have gone against the treaty, what does the Prophet وسلم say? He says, Abshiru bi wa'dillahi azza wa Abshiru bin Nasr. That's the darkest moment. The Prophet وسلم said to the companions, you know, get the glad tidings and the news from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Nasr, with the victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this is completely against the, the, the situation. Completely against the physical situation. But that's a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, describes the believers. He says, وَلَمَّا رَأَى الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الْأَحْزَابَ قَالُوا هَذَا مَا وَعَدَنَا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَصَدَقَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَمَا زَادَهُمْ إِلَّا إِيمَانًا وَتَسْلِيمًا And when the believers saw the Ahzab, all these troops gathering, and this whole predicament intensified, they said, this is what Allah and his messenger promised us. What did Allah and his messenger promise them? That they will get victory over these people. And it only this kind of physical situation increased them in faith and belief in the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of his attribute. Woman asdaqu min Allahi qila. Inna Allah la yukhliful mi'ad. Who is more truthful than Allah in his speech? Allah never breaks his promise. So although everything around them suggests the opposite, they held on to that faith. And that's worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these names and attributes. So that situation required of them trusting in the truthfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's what they did. So every test in life, every situation in life tests your faith in the names and attributes of Allah. And one way, one of the best ways to deal with any situation is to figure out which of the names and attributes this test is actually challenging in me that I need to hold on to. That's one of the best ways to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names and attributes. And that's why in a hadith, the Prophet explained, or he basically tells us about a man from previous nations. He says, when this man was about to die, جَمَعَ بَنِيهِ فَقَالَ يَا بَنِيهِ إِذَا أَنَا مِتُّ فَأَحْرِقُوا جَسَدِي if I die, you, you take my body and you burn it, you take the ashes and you throw them around with the wind and on the ocean. So when he died, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought him to him and he asked, Ya Abdi ma hamalaka ala ma fa'alt. Because the man said, La in qadir Allahu alayya la yu'adhibanni adaban nam yu'adhibhu ahada min al alameen. Because he said to his children, if Allah gets hold of me, he's going to punish me a punishment he is never given to any of the creation because of the bad things he did in his life. So Allah resurrected him and Allah asked him face to face, 
What made you do what you just did? He said, خوفك يا الله. He said, Oh Allah, it's my fear of you. فأدخله الله الجنة. Fear of Allah. He said, Oh Allah, my fear of you. So Allah entered him into paradise. Why? Because he worshipped Allah. He, has, he did the wrong thing. And this is not an invitation to do the wrong things, but just for you to see how powerful faith is in the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah saw that he had, he had genuine fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entered him into paradise. Although what he did was wrong, and even he had a negative thought about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if you are going to basically throw my ashes around, Allah won't be able to bring me back to life. That's a wrong notion about Allah. But his fear of Allah was so huge, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him because of that belief. So you, we need to ask ourselves in every situation, what are the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are being challenged in this situation that I need to hold on to and increase my faith in? And increase my faith in. That's the way really to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every situation. Uh, there are names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, I will conclude with what we started again, that the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could fall into two types. Uh, n names and attributes that are exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should not seek to get a share of them like Asma'ul Azama Asma'ul Azama Asma'ul Sifat Al-Mutalliqa Bil Azama the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that signify glory, might, uh, power, pride of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because these belong to Allah exclusively we're not supposed to seek anything of them if anyone seeks a share of them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish them and break their back uh, but there's another category or another type of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that actually we are me we're meant to emulate we're meant to emulate and possess within ourselves like the an asma'u ar-rahma wa sifatuha it's basically the names and attributes of Allah that signify mercy uh, ease easygoingness and kindness like the hadith we call like beauty as well patience Patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself in the Quran as he is a sabur. Allah is patient. Allah is patient. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Wallahu yuhibbu sabirin and Allah loves the patient ones. So we need to recognize the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we should not emulate, but we should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by having the opposite of them. So with the might and the pride of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should have humility. Humility. Uh, with the richness and the wealth and the sufficiency of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have need and poverty and lack. We recognize this. This is why Imam Al-Qayyim, at the beginning of his book, Tariq Al-Hijratain, he says, لا يبلغ العبد منزلا في عبودية الله عز وجل حتى يرى ثقره مقابل غنى ربه عز وجل. He says, حقيق, and he says even حقيقة العبودية إنما هي في الفقر إلى الله. So he says a person will never find, will never enter properly into the concept of worship and servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless they recognize their own poverty and lack and need to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No way. He says actually the reality of worship and servitude is to recognize your poverty, your lack and your need compared to the richness and sufficiency of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says that's the reality of, of, of servitude and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So... With these names of might and power, we look at our weakness, we look at the opposite, and we seek to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these. We humble ourselves before Allah. Whereas the other type of the names and attributes of Allah, we said these are the ones that we should emulate. And generally speaking, they are the names and attributes that pertain to Ar-Rahma and mercy. And you should also look through the Quran. It would be a very interesting, by the way, a very interesting way to look throughout the Quran because many of the verses, actually a majority of the verses of the Quran are concluded with what? Are sealed with names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you might want to see which of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'm supposed to emulate and which one of them I'm supposed to keep exclusively for Allah and worship Allah through observing them and observing their rights. So we said, for example, as sabur Allah loves, Allah himself is patient, and he says, he loves the patient. He says, in Allah sabirin Allah is with the patient ones. So this is an attribute of Allah that we are meant to emulate, that we are meant to possess within ourselves as well and display in our lives. Um, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself as shakur. Allah is thankful, a grateful. Allah is thankful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves among his creation who? Shakirin. The ones who are thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Islam really is. Uh, Shaykh Islam Tamiyyah, he says, Al-Islamu nisfun shukrun wa nisfun sabrun. He says, the reality of Islam is two things. Half of Islam is uh, shukr, gratitude and thankfulness to Allah. And the other half is, half is patience. He says, that's what Islam really is. All of Islam falls under these two things. So Allah loves these to be within us. Same, we said rifq, gentleness, kindness. That Allah loves that and loves to see it. So we do it. Allah loves mercy. He's merciful and he's merciful to the ones that are merciful. So Allah treats us in kind when we emulate these names and attributes and we are supposed to get more of them. The same again, beauty. Beauty is a great aspect of worship. In Allah, Jameelun, Yuhibbul Jamal, we said everything. Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty and everything Allah loves ends up being an act of worship. Ends up being an act of worship. So I ask Allah SWT to make this some sort of, uh, uh, I would say, I think I was trying to pick your brains with all of what I said. Get you to start thinking about these things, maybe pay more attention to the names and attributes of Allah SWT. They're not just ending for verses, they're not just there for decoration or for us just to memorize them. They're actually a way of life. The names and attributes of Allah SWT are the way of life. And I'll conclude with the quote again from Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala where he says, At-ta'abudu lillahi azza wa jalla bi asma'ihi wa sifatihi tariqun sahlun wadihun qareeb. Worshipping Allah through his names and attributes is a, is a path that is so close, easy, and it's like a shortcut. La quta'a fih wa la awarida ta'tarih. There is no bandits, highway robbers in it that will hijack you. It's quite safe. And there are no distractions in it. يصل السالك فيه إلى إلى أعلى درجات الجنة على جنب من الراحة. He reaches the highest ranks. A person who follows that path, he reaches the highest ranks in paradise, in a state of ease and relaxation. In a state of ease and relaxation. He says وهذا طريق المقربين. This is the way of the مقربين, the ones that are closest to Allah سبحانه وتعالى. We ask نسأل الله عز وجل أن يجعلنا من المقربين. أن يزيدنا علما وأن ينفعنا بما علمنا بارك الله فيكم وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم. Do we have time for questions? Are we done? Questions? طيب. Is there any questions? Is there a question? جزاك الله خير. I appreciate it. جزاك الله خير صحيح. Any questions? Direct questions. جزاك الله خير. Okay, so this is a question about hijab, and I will keep it for Sheikh Uthman al Khamis. Questions about the topic we just mentioned. هل الحزن والبكاء عند الابتلاء يتنافى مع الرضا بقضاء بقضاء الله عز وجل? This is a good question. Is uh, feeling sad and even emotional and even weeping uh, at times of trials and hardship? Is that does that contradict? Uh, being pleased with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, absolutely no. Because uh, griefing over a situation or experiencing pain and sadness over a situation is a human aspect. And you can actually go through it when your heart is pleased with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed to happen, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees. And this is why uh, the Prophet sallallahu when his son died, he actually cried. So Umar says, Tabki Ya Rasulullah, he says, O Messenger of Allah, you're weeping like you're shedding tears. The Prophet ﷺ turns to him and he says, Innaha rahmah. He says, This is mercy. This is mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, and the Prophet ﷺ, when his son also died, he said, Inna al qalba la yahzan. The heart feels the sadness. Wa inna al ayna la tadma. And the eye sheds tears. Wa la naqulu illa ma yurdi al rabb. Wa inna ala firaqika. And indeed we are in a state of sadness and grief O Ibrahim for your departure But we only say that which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The Prophet sallallahu Could we say that he wasn't pleased with the decree of Allah? Absolutely he was pleased with Allah He was pleased with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He accepted it But part of our humanity is to go through the experience This is why living in denial is not patience 
Some people live their hardship or they go through the hardship in denial. No, this is not a healthy way to go through it. And this is why it was actually narrated from Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad. Rahimahullah. was one of the great worshippers and scholars. Like uh, when his son died, he smiled. His son died, he smiled. So he was asked, like his son died, he said, Ridham bi qadha illa. He says, I'm smiling out of my pleasure with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn al Qayyim comments in thi- on this and he says, Wahada naqsun wa laysa kamal. And he says, This is deficiency and it's not a good trait. He says, Li anna man huwa akmalu minhu. Hazina wa baka wa huwa radhim bi qadha illa hi azza wa jalla. He says, Because who is better than him, the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, he experienced sadness and he wept when he was pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So going through these emotions is not contradictory to being pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, number two. ما هي نصيحتك بعد الاستعانة بالله والدعاء لتربية الأولاد هنا في كندا. This is a big question is you know, what would be the advice after obviously seeking Allah's help and dua to bring up our children here in Canada? This is really a topic that needs to be addressed in, uh, in lectures. And uh, I think we spoke previously, I, th- I remember the uh, December conference, the December conference at the end of the year, not this year, 2016, we actually spoke about this in detail. I believe we spoke about this in detail, so you might find some of this, you'll find a lot of these lectures actually on YouTube, and this really requires uh, an extensive treatment, but generally speaking, uh, as you said, dua and making, uh, and having isti'ana and reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it requires basically winning your children over, really winning your children over. If your children have a sense, this is the one thing I will share, if your children have a sense of belonging at home, they, ha- they feel welcome, they feel, they feel safe, they feel they can truly, like, they are appreciated in the home environment, it just becomes harder for them to seek these things outside, to seek validation outside. So if they have a healthy environment at home, a friendly environment, true love, I'm not talking about spoiling, I'm talking about true love and respect and uh, showing true worth to these kids, this can actually make them more healthy emotionally, so they don't need to seek validation from external sources. Uh, do we have any questions? Direct questions? Okay. إذا كان هناك تقصير في تحصيل العلم الشرعي والقرآن مع وجود مساعدات من الحكومة الكندية للمعيشة، هل أولى دراسة علم؟ دنيوي والعمل أم دراسة العلم الشرعي والقرآن. So this basically, if someone is falling short in seeking Islamic knowledge and learning the Quran, and they're basically taking uh, sort of welfare from the government for their sustenance, uh, which is better in one of these two choices: either study um, some kind of discipline or skill and then seek work to provide for oneself, or uh, study. Islamic knowledge and the Quran really there's no one answer fits all this it it depends it really depends because there are people if they study Islam uh, basically they can help the community and they have a future there so for these people the study of Islam might have priority Uh, for some people even if they study Islam it might be just a matter of luxury for them and they don't have a future with it some people don't have a bent or a head for knowledge and studying and teaching so you, I mean, you can't give both people the same answer. Just like this morning, Sheikh Uthman al-Khamis, he explained about the Prophet Sallallahu he was asked the same question by different people, but he would give, Jazakallah uh, khairan, but he would give different answers. So again, that's what wisdom actually entails. And it depends as well, is the person male or a female? Are they a parent or not? Do they have, Jazakallah uh, khairan, do they have social support, etc.? What are their long-term plans? So don't seek... I would say an answer to this question in a vacuum. There are so many aspects to be considered there before an answer like this is to be given. So don't seek for a quick answer for that. (laughs) 
في حالة زواج المطلقة الحاضنة هل هناك حرج أن الطفل يعيش مع الأم؟ If a woman who's divorced and she has custody of her child uh, is there harm with the child living with her? Well, this is a there's a religious ruling there. It's basically when a, a woman who's divorced she decides to marry again, uh, then she she basically loses custody according to the Jumhur of the ulama. She loses the custody, and that doesn't mean the custody necessarily goes to the husband. It could go to the mother of the husband, or to her own mother, or to uh, an, uh, her, uh, her sister, or, or his sister, and so on and so forth. This is something as well that cannot be just answered like this. So if a divorcee gets married, a divorced woman gets married, uh, uh, the ruling is that, as Imam Ahmed indicated clearly, that she loses the custody of her child. But that's the principal ruling. But the other circumstances have to be studied. Maybe the father is not qualified really to take care of the child. Maybe there's no other person to take custody of the child. Then this is something that the judge has to look into and make the best estimation in the best interest of the child, religiously and dunya-wise. I'll leave this question for Sheikh Uthman al khamis I really don't know the answer. Okay, uh, there there is someone who always thinks about being upon hypocrisy and they always fear the thought of it is that bad. They also reflect on their actions in terms of not falling into it. Generally speaking, uh, a believer should not feel safe with regards to their faith. They never feel like uh, Imam Abdullah al-Mubarak, he says, Man amina Allah ala deenihi tarfa ta'in salabahu iya. Whoever feels so safe and they take their religion for granted, Allah will take their faith away from them. So, and this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in Surah Al-Mu'minun, uh, when he describes the believers that they do all these acts of worship and then Allah says they do all, all these acts of devotion and Allah says and they give whatever they give for the sake of Allah when their hearts are in a state of fear that they should return should they return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Aisha radiallahu anha asks the Prophet وسلم, are these people who are doing like sins and they fear the punishment of Allah the Messenger وسلم, says no these are people who pray and fast and give sadaqah but they are fearful of the punishment of Allah because they don't have any guarantee that Allah has accepted their deeds and Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu he approaches Hudayf ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu who was the keeper of the secret of the Prophet وسلم. the Prophet وسلم, in, disclosed to him the names of the hypocrites as they were given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Umar al-Khattab kept chasing Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, astahlifuka billah, a'addani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam munafiqeen. Umar al-Khattab was chasing Hudayf saying, I ask you by Allah, did the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa ever name me among the hypocrites? Did he put me in the list of hypocrites? Does that mean Umar al-Khattab had doubts about his faith? No, but this kind of fear, this kind of fear is actually healthy. But don't take it to excess. There are people who have this waswas. They have this obsessive doubts and negative thinking about themselves that it gets them to a point where they start despairing of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they really start to, it starts to get to them and eat on them uh, that they are actually hypocrites to the point that they might end up leaving salah altogether saying what's the point or leaving the deen altogether and so on and so forth. So they need to be careful that there is a point of balance. You never take your faith for granted and you never feel despair in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you see yourself. So you always, as again, Shaykh Ahmad al-Khamis today mentioned that there should be a balance between al-khawf wa raja fearing the punishment of Allah and that you fall short for meeting you know, the conditions that Allah wants and on the other side is actually hoping in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are doing the right thing. Uh, I have come across this saying that goes, tears are prayers too. Is this true according to Islam? Well, not necessarily tears are prayers, 
But really, I mean, tearing up out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is a great sign of faith. And not necessarily taking faith for granted again. The Prophet ﷺ says in the authentic hadith, Aynani la tamassuhum an nar. Aynun bakat min khashyatillah wa aynun batat tahrusu fi sabilillah. The Messenger ﷺ says, There are two eyes that the fire will never touch. Uh, an eye that tears up because of the fear and khashya by the way is not only fear it has also the element of love in it, it is uh, an eye that really cries out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of khashya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and an eye that were that stayed open guarding for the sake of guarding the territory for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it's not necessarily prayer but it's a great sign and it's definitely something to be rewarded for uh, rewarded uh, for هل لصلاة الضحى قضاء صلاة الضحى can it be made up I personally really don't know هل لصلاة الوتر قضاء صلاة الوتر is there a قضاء for it yes uh, إمام النووي رحمه الله تعالى in شرح صحيح مسلم he actually talks about how the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he mentions hadith from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم من فاته ورده من الليل uh, whoever misses their صلاه at night he would pray it as ضحى so if generally speaking he would pray uh, for example at night let's say five rak'ah all together qiyam and witr uh, the way to make it up is actually to pray duha as six rak'ah as six rak'ah okay so this is actually explained by imam al-nawi in uh, in sharh sahih muslim the ex- commentary on sahih muslim that's the gist of what he said basically you can make up your witr salah in the form of duha by adding one rak'ah to the average number you usually stand up هل يجوز الصلاة أمام وراء إمام مقعد على الكرسي؟ Is it permissible to make salah behind an imam who is praying on a chair? Well, ideally, the person who is supposed to lead the salah is the one that's most knowledgeable of the Quran, and And uh, obviously, there are there are parameters the Prophet ﷺ specified. But the scholars uh, say that the one who has the right, if they are equal with all of these parameters, uh, people who are physically uh, in shape, uh, he- healthy, like they don't have a disability, a clear manifest disability that affects their performance of the positions of salah. So people are able to perform the positions of salah in the right way they would have precedence over people who are unable. So ideally, a person, such a person should not lead the salah. Should not lead the salah if there are more healthy people uh, or people who are able to perform the salah uh, properly or the positions of salah properly. But there's a concern, there's an issue here. If this is an imam al-ratib, if the imam of the masjid who is appointed by a government, for example, he prays on a chair, can you make a big deal out of it? The scholars say no. Scholars say, no, I remember like a few years uh, back when we used to visit our Sheikh, Sheikh Ali Al-Halabi, Hafizahullah, in his masjid that's right next to his house, there's an older person, he's the Imam, Al-Ratib of the masjid, and basically um, he prays on a chair. I remember like that was a shock for us, so we asked the Sheikh, he said, that's the Imam Al-Ratib. He's appointed by the government, we can't challenge him, and that's the view he takes, so we just pray behind him. But ideally, the, if there's a choice about an imam, then as we said, someone who's able to perform the salah, uh, the acts of salah properly. Okay. We answered this. If a person did um, big sin, a big sin, how can he like find or get his sins forgiven before he die? I mean, just turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in true repentance and remorse and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and increase in acts of worship. One man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he said, Ya Rasulallah, like I met this old friend, girlfriend of mine and I kissed her. I kissed her. Uh, ended up kissing her. So the, he, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, this is what happened. So Allah, what can I do? How can I get my sins forgiven? So Allah ﷻ revealed to the Messenger ﷺ, uh, 
وأقم الصلاة طرفي النهار وزلفا من الليل إن الحسنات يذهبن السيئات إن سورة هود الله سبحانه وتعالى revealed and established the salah uh, at the beginning and the end two ends of the of the day uh, and during the night as well إن الحسنات يذهبن السيئات ذلك ذكر للذاكرين indeed good deeds remove bad deeds and sins so you need to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek forgiveness and keep seeking forgiveness and uh, you need to increase in acts of worship that please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hopefully you will outcrowd uh, your sins we still have time what's going on uh, stretching okay <clears throat> كنت شاب طيب كنت شابا ضائعا بعيدا عن الله عز وجل وتكرم المولى جل جلاله بالهداية والتقرب منه. So I was a lost young man far from Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Then Allah guided me and allowed me to seek nearness to Him. وبدأت بحفظ كتاب الله وتغيرت حياتي للأفضل والحمد لله. Started memorizing the book of Allah and my life started moving to the better. مشكلتي مع أهلي وأصحابي فمع الأسف أهلي وإخواني بعيدون عن الله وأوامره هم يحبون الله هم هم يحبون الله ولكن لا يلتزمون بأوامره سبحانه so my problem is with my family and my friends unfortunately my family and my brothers and sisters they are far from Allah and His commands they love Allah but they do not they're not practicing وللأسف أختي انجرفت وراء زناديق الفضائيات المسلمين شيوخ سنة 2018 and my sister got like carried away with some people on uh, like uh, those TV stations that are considered to be sheikhs of 2018 ومنهم عدنان إبراهيم and محمد شحرور والقرآنيين وابن أختي انجرف وراء فرقة الأشباح I think uh, what he means is uh, الأحباش okay uh, and okay, my sister so started following some of these deviant people who are basically uh, presenting some nonsense. And his brother joined one of the deviant sects. So how can, I'm always in a fight and spoiling how can I deal with this situation? Well, this is a common thing. It's really a common thing. And and it's a, it's a very common occurrence with people who start actually practicing the religion. You have to realize that when you come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you, you're also coming with a lot of force and power. After all that, you're coming with a lot of zeal, so you might be actually carried away with what you do. This is something we have to acknowledge. Uh, most of the brothers who started practicing Islam, they actually become harsh sometimes. And I'm not saying that's your case, but we just need to you know, be careful. If this is the case, we need to acknowledge it, because if we recognize it, we can deal with it, inshallah. Uh, what I would say, since you have just recently started coming to uh, the religion of Allah and, and studying Islam and learning the Quran, that's the time this is the time you need the least distractions some people have this kind of like uh, warrior mentality once they see the truth they want to fix everything i say i'm telling you don't overwhelm yourself at the beginning we've seen a lot of people they started practicing the, they started wanting to fix everything at home they wanted to fix everyone they know they started challenging everything and they got overwhelmed and they ended up unable to handle the situation and then they just gave up on the whole thing and they left even sometimes islam altogether so you don't want to overwhelm yourself. Your priority now is really to increase the level of your faith, increase the level of your knowledge, and increase the level of your connection to students of knowledge who study Islam and teach Islam and practice Islam. Because we don't just want people who just study Islam but show the opposite or actually possess the opposite. We need people who really have the knowledge of Islam and live the knowledge of Islam. So these are the people that you really need to uh, you know, start to mix more with and with regards to the fights with your family, what I would rec recognize at the beginning, and this is different to different people. Some people are resilient and strong. Some people are very sensitive and weak. You don't want to overwhelm yourself. You might want to sort of uh, slam the brakes, slow it down with your family and with your brothers and sisters who are throwing accusations at you. Forget about what they say. 
Okay, because the Prophet ﷺ said, بدأ الإسلام غريبا وسيعود غريبا كما بدأ Islam started as a stranger. We retain to be a stranger as it used to be at the beginning. Uh, but basically, don't really pay attention to that. Because if you pay attention to that, it's going to get to you at some level. So you need to avoid all of this. And you need to strengthen and fortify your heart. Learn more Quran. Practice more Quran. Learn the Islam, the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, And practice it, not only externally, but even in your heart. And start improving and fixing yourself, you will get to a point, I'm telling you, a point of strength in faith and resilience and impact that you will actually start transforming the people around you without having to get engaged in fights. As we said previously, inner beauty, specifically Islamic guidance when it comes to how we should be inside, are extreme, is extremely captivating. Extremely captivating Muslims how did they spread Islam in Southeast Asia? The biggest Muslim countries like Indonesia and Malaysia. How? By their conduct. They inspired people, they inspired nations into Islam. And this is something that's doable. So, uh, so build yourself, avoid fights, avoid conflicts at any cost at the beginning. And you really don't need to get there. But sometimes we need that validation, I'm doing the truth, I need to have this enmity. No. Try to really avoid it. You don't need distractions. You need to learn more. You need to develop your faith more. You need to invest more in that. Build a strong foundation. Then you might want to assess, is it really worth it getting into arguments or discussions or trying to help other people? So help yourself first before you start helping other people. Because we've seen a lot of brothers and sisters. They start at the beginning practicing Islam learning and they jump right into giving the da'wah and fixing people, fixing family and getting into arguments and discussions and so on and so forth, which ends up with them losing their faith, losing interest, getting overwhelmed, being disillusioned with the whole situation. We are human beings. We are human beings. So I look at the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't get into arguments at the beginning of his da'wah. It was secret da'wah. You need to establish a foundation before you deal with all of this pressure. I'm telling you, this is quite traumatic. It's quite traumatic for our young brothers and sisters who start practicing, they go through this. It's traumatic. So don't put yourself right in the front line with this kind of attacks and fire. I'm telling you, avoid it. You need to keep it low-key. Worry about building yourself have good friends around, good company around that you spend time with. If you don't have enough of that, you have a lot of online uh, sources where you can r listen to lectures and, and see discussions and read things and maybe connect with some brothers, and brothers online and the sisters with some sisters online that will actually help you support, create an environment that strengthens your Iman. Then at some stage when you reach a level of maturity, maybe you are able to have discussions and so on and so forth. That would be my advice. That's it, right? جزاكم الله خيرا وبارك الله فيكم صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم بارك الله فيكم